Uh, thank you very much, Gavin, and for everyone who's, who invited me. And um, as he said, it was a somewhat last minute um, invitation. <clears throat> because, as you will notice, I'm not Robert Storr. I don't look like Robert Storr. I can't think like Robert Storr. Nor can I write like Robert Storr. Much as I'd like to be Robert Storr, I am not him. I used to be a painter. Um, I went to art college, and for a long time, I thought that I was a painter. I'm not a painter any more than I am Robert Storr. At some point, I realized that I was better as a writer. Does this mean that I've somehow uh, fallen out of love with painting? Was I ever in love with painting? I'm not sure at all about this idea that um, painting is something we love. Uh, it's something we look at, it's something we practice, it's something we're engaged. Do you, do you ask a mathematician if he is in love with mathematics? I guess really you do it because you're good at it, or you'll think you think you're good at it. I know I did. If we are going to talk about an appetite for painting, uh, it's a kind of hunger game, isn't it? Uh, I'm 60 years old now, and I left the studio more than 20 years ago. And I've curated painting exhibitions, and I've looked at a lot of paintings in my career as a critic. I am a man who has eaten too much. And I'd really like to say, I'm not really hungry anymore. I'm full. I'm done here. I've had good meals and bad meals, meals just to keep me going, great meals and indifferent meals. The bad stuff puts you off. But sooner or later, you feel empty again, and you go back. A couple of weeks ago, a new gallery opened in London, uh, which was full of paintings. They were all the same size, and they ran around the walls at a kind of regular pace. They were all different, and they were all the same. They were kind of flat but lumpy. There were dark ones, light ones, bright ones, dim ones, ones with a kind of crack cracky, crackled um, surface. Uh, they all had a sort of um, reference point back to Gerhard Richter's squeegee paintings. But they were somehow more formulaic than Richter's ever are. And where the paint rose up in, in its kind of rills and its waves, dry pigment had been scattered about the surface to make them look somehow more um, contoured than they really were. It was a bit like looking at the edge of a desert or a mountain range from the air as you fly over the landscape. They were horrible, really. <laughs> they, I'm not going to say who the artist was, uh, someone you'll probably never hear of again but is obviously someone who, in this swanky, swish, West End gallery, under the uh, halogen lights or the LED lights or whatever it is they use these days, um, was the flavor of the month. It was the Nouvelle Cuisine of this year. Um, it was fast food. There's a lot of painting like this, and there always has been. Back in the late 1960s, the studios of New York were full of not dissimilar works, but works which were talked about in very different terms from the ones we might use today. The last fag end of post-painterly abstraction. And when those paintings didn't sell, they were rolled up and thrown out along with the trash. And in a very amusing essay by Dave Hickey, he talks about these paintings and how they were often picked up by homeless people on the streets of New York 
and used to make tents in Tompkins Park. Another, because they were waterproof. <laughs> and for a while, the streets of New York were full of post-painterly abstractions in the mode of Helen Frankenthaler and Jules Zelitsky being used to keep people dry. At least they had some use. They had, they had use value, uh, but perhaps not one which the artists had originally intended. A lot of painting, painters seem to me to end up a bit like ambulance chasers, always chasing the big thing that was already dealt with and finished by the time that they picked up their brushes themselves. It doesn't only happen to painters, it happens throughout the art world. And it happens in the literary world too. In the end, people do find their own voice often, but very often they don't. I don't know how people discover a voice. It's something very mysterious. In the same way that not everyone gets the appetite for looking at painting, much less making them for themselves. How many artists really have managed to deal with Picasso or Francis Bacon? They're almost untouchable. You've got to be extremely good and original to do something with your forebears, whoever they are. And yet we keep going back and looking again and again and hoping to take something from those painters who are, who are already out there. The first show I ever saw that in, in really the words of Bruce Nauman hit me over the head like a baseball bat was Goya. It wasn't the black paintings. It wasn't even the naked Macha, who some of my school fellows, I was 11 at the time, were sniggering over. It was some of his earlier paintings that were studies for tapestries. There was something about their space, something about these frozen gestures of the kids playing children's games, which Goya had taken originally from the earlier paintings of Murillo, something about them which seemed to me utterly mysterious and magical, much more so than the children's books or the early children's television programs that I was looking at at the time. No one had prepared me for Goya, and I still look at Goya, and I'm still mystified by him and by the ways in which he made his paintings. And what's also important about Goya, of course, is that, especially in his last paintings, he wasn't working for a patron and he wasn't working for a mar market. He was working for himself. I'm not a restaurant critic. Um, I'd hate to be a restaurant critic when you eat professionally, but I guess I look at art professionally. And one of the important things is to keep your taste alive and fresh, to keep your palate somehow cleansed. So after Goya, I might want to go and look at a bit of fundamental painting or perhaps uh, a deconstructed painting, something which is lighter fare. I don't know, Watteau, for example, which is always, to me, like drinking Perrier. Some people, of course, um, have a theoretical stake in looking at art, and they have a system, and they have a discourse. Um, Yves Lambois, for example. One of the interesting things about Yves Lambois, whether he's talking about Matisse's drawing, or he's talking about the paintings, I don't know, Bryce Marden, for example, there's a certain theoretical bent to the way he writes and describes things, which seems to me quite at odds with the often intuitive ways in which artists actually work. They know not what they do, do they, Marlene? I can't paint like Marlene Dumas. I would love to paint like Marlene Dumas, even though we were born on the same day, and the same year, and I admire her paintings very much. I am not Marlene de Dumas. I am not a dirty woman. Even if I were a woman, even if I were a woman, 
I couldn't paint like Marlene Dumas. Who knows what we get from our mothers and our fathers? Last weekend, I did a talk in London with Luke Toymans. You might have heard of him. And he told me how he remembers, as a kid, his father making him one of those plastic aeroplane kits, you know, that you glue together. And I always, I always used to get the glue on the windscreen, and it always used to fuck it up a bit. But his dad made him a warplane and even painted the camouflage on the wings. And Luke said he only recently realized that the way his father painted the model aeroplane with his little touches and strokes of green and ochre to make it camouflaged was exactly the way that Luke himself paints, that the touch was exactly the same. It's genetic, he told me last weekend. <laughs> you don't get much touch in uh, Florentine painting. But touch is everything if you're looking at Titian. You can feel it when you look. The same is true, of course, of Velasquez. All those little droplets and spits that make up a frothy bit of lace or a cuff or an earring. When you look, there is this wonderful tension between the way something has been made and the thing it depicts. This tension and this, this physical as well as psychological relationship between the language and the thing the language describes is in painting probably one of its primary core um, it's at the core of it, it's at the heart of it. And I think if one doesn't appreciate that, one doesn't really appreciate what a painting is or can be. Of course, a lot of paintings are self-effacing in that they subdue touch, or they get rid of it, they expunge it, or they, in the case of John Curran, they turn touch into something almost disgusting and squeamish which in Curran's case is quite deliberate and is perhaps meant to be a kind of critique of the painters, the mannerists, which his work ultimately derives from. It's often said these days, um, and I remember an art student of mine once saying, an art student who became an extremely successful painter, that no art before 1945 mattered anymore. Well. Probably painters in studios now are saying no art before 9-11 mattered. Um, it's false, of course, but one has to dramatize oneself in a certain way in relation to history. Um, Francis Bacon famously said that it was either the National Gallery or the trash can for his work. Uh, and there are ways in which Bacon uh, made paintings which looked like old masters and had the flavor of old masters without actually being old masters. You have to have a relationship of, to history of one sort or another. If I were a young artist now, I don't know what I'd do. Perhaps I didn't know what I'd do back then. Some young painters make a fantastic radical move very early on in their career. I'm thinking particularly, as a good example, of Frank Stella. Frank Stella made a fantastic radical move in his art when he was about 23. How was he able to do this, to make those striped paintings, these rhetorical, uh, ever-repeating stripes whose width was the same as the depth of the stretcher uh, which seemed to work their way towards the center of the canvas and then out again, and which seemed at once to relate to the, the uh, buildings of Philip Johnson in New York, to pinstripe suits, and, because of one of the titles he gave those early paintings, back to the concentration camps, Work Makes You Free. <laughs> 
How did he do that, such a young artist? How did he manage to ditch history? How did he manage to go round someone like Jasper Johns, for example, and the abstract expressionists, and make something which was a precursor to minimalism and something which seemed to, re seemed to be talking about painting in much the same way that Clement Greenberg talked about painting in that its first concern was to, be, was to deal with itself as a medium. How did he do that? I think he managed to do it because he was ignorant, because he wasn't burdened by history, because he wasn't thinking back to the 17th, 18th, and 19th century history of painting. He wasn't, as Harold Rosenberg, I think, famously said, you know, he wasn't trying to make European, European style easel paintings. But can you have perpetual ignorance? Can you ever develop as though you were seeing art for the first time? You know, there's this wonderful John Berger essay about uh, Jackson Pollock, um, a very wrong-headed essay, in as much as Berger's writing is often wrong-headed, but within it there is, there is um, a wonderful humanity, and he leaps over um, facts in order to tell us something deeper which are beyond uh, bor <laughs> boring reality. Um, he said that Pollock managed to do, Pollock's paintings were like the work of a man who had never seen the world, who had spent the first half of his life in a white cell uh, and was one day suddenly let out and faced with the multiplicity of the world, with its strangeness, its exoticness. He was like being let out into the best restaurant in the world and that his paintings were a kind of joyous response to the incomprehensible complexity of the world about us. Of course, it's not true. And Pollock's biographers will talk about young Jackson and Charles and Sandy being taken out with their dad, who I think was a surveyor, into the desert and into the mountains and watching his dad pissing on a rock on a hot day where the urine would make these wonderful shapes on the hot stones and evaporate and that there was something as magical about that and as, and as, as a sort of er uh, image and as something as, as um, fundamental to Pollock's development as was looking at um, Navajo sand paintings or whatever it was that he was supposed to have got much of his uh, inspiration from. And of course we know that Pollock's development was not a straightforward process. You've seen those very inept, uh, supposedly Michelangelo-like figure drawings that he made. And we know, of course, that uh, what Thomas Hart Benton, the American ruralist, uh, that somehow in that, you know, what his influence on Pollock was in terms of spatial construction and so forth. Uh, but this is to take an almost uh, Eva Lambois reading or an art historical reading of looking back and trying to trace the way an artist works through, through both autobiography and through a kind of historical inevitability. This is a sort of historicist approach, which for me doesn't quite work either. But can we ever really understand what private things an artist may think? Stella, of course, said, I want the painting on the canvas or to be as good as it was in the can, as though to, to cut out any kind of extra visual information from the way in which we look. And yet there is always extra visual information, isn't there? However abstract an artist might be, it always has some reference back to the real world. And those early paintings of Stella, as I think I said, you know, do have a relationship to New York's modernist architecture uh, and to Wall Street and to corporate America. And of course, paintings are part of real lived experience. They're as much as part of the world as a tree is, but perhaps less explicable. Science can explain a tree, but they can't really explain what we feel when we look at one. Perhaps all painters are translators, uh, where Painting is an act of translation, not just of the world itself, but of the paintings that they have seen. They are ventriloquizing, perhaps, the painters who've come before them. So even if theory 
tried to kill painting. I think it was always a myth anyway, because the idea of crisis and the death of painting and, and so forth is sexy. Crisis is sexy. You know, this idea that you're in the trenches fighting a war on behalf of a medium uh, and trying to save it for being overrun by these terrible theorists and, and post-medium artists is, 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 is a sexy myth, you know? Uh, makes you feel good in a certain way. Um, this idea that you're like Bacon, you know, painting for the museum, painting for the National Gallery, rather than from the squalid commercial marketplace uh, is something which makes a lot of artists uneasy and makes some critics uneasy too. So what do you do? How are you to invent yourself? Ignorance or knowledge? The past or the future? Maybe those kinds of questions are ones that paintings themselves can't answer, but they are ones that artists worry about. Talking to artists, especially the ones that are really good, one gets the sense of someone who thinks differently. Because there are all kinds of ways of being a painter. You don't actually have to go out with a spear and a club into the world to kill your enemies. You can go your own way. You can take a different direction entirely. Things are possible. They always were possible. They go on being possible. You've got to be hungry, though. But for what? I'm really not sure. And I was never hungry enough as an artist, which is why I'm almost Adrian Searle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian, for that. Um, we have a few moments for any immediate questions, if there are any immediate questions. We do have a session this afternoon, as I said early on, but if there is an immediate question you think you have to have answered before we break for coffee, please raise your hand and we can deal with it while Adrian's still at the podium. My question is, um, I'm interested in uh, that's why, uh, why um, contemporary painting uh, in the uh, first Biennale, uh, uh, example, Manifesto, document, um, uh, uh, Venezia Biennale, um, why painting um, absent, uh, almost why absent? Why isn't it there? Why isn't, it, why isn't there painting in the big Biennales? Well, there are paintings in Biennales all the time, um, but they're, they're not in the first place. Um, that's partly curatorial fashion. That curatorial fashion is, comes from a suspicion that painting is so market-driven and market-led uh, that it isn't serious and important in the way in which other kinds of art making are. So I think it is partly to do, partly to do with uh, a, a misplaced uh, curatorial fashion. Uh, and because other kinds of ways of working look sexier in biennales, that somehow um, there is something more dramatic about, uh, I don't know, a big installation than there is about these meek little flat objects hanging on the wall. Uh, I'm not sure it's to do with anything much more than that. Uh, and of course, what goes around comes around. And, you know, 20 years ago, painting was dead, and now it clearly isn't. Uh, and it's popular with the market, but it's not necessarily popular with the curatorial class.